timers are often thought of as the heartbeat of an embedded system. Whether you need a periodic wake-up call, a one-time delay, or need a means to verify that the system is running without failure, timers are the solution. This chapter begins with a brief summary of the MSP430 timers. Most of the chapter, though, is spent digging into the details of the MSP430's Timer A module. Not only does it provide rudimentary counting and timing features, but provides sophisticated capture and compare features that allow a variety of complex waveforms or, or interrupts to be generated. In fact, this timer can even generate PWM, that is, pulse width modulation signals. Along the way, we examine the MSP430 where driver lib code required to set up and utilize these timers. As the chapter nears conclusion, there's a brief summary of the differences between timer A and timer B. Bottom line, if you know how to use timer A, then you can use timer B. But there are a couple of extra features that timer B provides. We begin with a high-level overview of the MSP430 timers. The MSP430 F5529 timers are highlighted on this diagram. The timers shown here are similar to what you'll find on most MSP430 devices, though not all 430s have as many timers as this. The instances of timer A are marked with yellow. Timer B is marked with pink. The watchdog timer, kind of hidden up there inside the system block, is highlighted with light brown, while as dark brown highlights the real-time clock RTC underscore A. The nomenclature of the timer A and B peripherals may seem a little unusual at first. These two timers are very similar, but since they added a few features along the way, they bumped the name from timer A to timer B. As you can see, we have instances of both on the F5529. This said, there's a little bit more to the nomenclature than just the difference between timer A and timer B. The timer nomenclature is also determined by two other things. One of them is the number of CCR registers that each timer contains. That is, the number of capture and compare registers a given timer instance has. Also, which timer instance is it? If, for example, we have three timer A's on a part, we need to be able to determine one versus another. TA0, TA1, TA2. So, for example, you might say that TA0 is the first instance of timer underscore A that we have on this part. TA1 happens to be a timer underscore A3 because it has three CCR registers. The same thing goes for TA2. And then TB0, the first instance of timer B, has seven capture and compare registers. Don't worry, we'll dig into the details of what those capture and compare registers are as we go through this chapter. The Timers and Training callout box describes where the various timers are discussed in this workshop. Timers A and B are covered in this chapter. We've already covered the Watchdog Timer in a previous chapter. And the Real-Time Clock module will be discussed in a future chapter. A brief description of the Real-Time Clock, or RTC, tells us that it's a very low-power clock, has built-in calendar functions, and often includes alarms that can interrupt the CPU. It is frequently used for keeping a time base while the CPU is in low power mode. Before we discuss the details of timer A, let's begin with a quick overview describing how timers in, in general work. Specifically, we start with how a timer is constructed using a counter. Then we investigate the capture and compare capabilities found in many timers. A counter, seen in the middle of this slide, is the fundamental hardware element found inside of a timer. The other essential element is a clock input. And, when the timer finishes, it can generate some action, like an interrupt. As you see here, the counter is incremented each time it's clocked. A 16-bit timer counts from 0 all the way up to FFFF, which is 64K. When the timer reaches its maximum value, it overflows. That is, it returns to 0 and starts counting upward again. Most timer peripherals can generate an interrupt when this overflow occurs. On timer A, the interrupt flag bit for this event is called TAIFG, or Timer A Interrupt Flag. The clock input signal for Timer A, named TA clock, can be one of the internal MSP430 clocks or a signal coming from a GPIO pin. Often called timer counters because they provide both capabilities, they can generate interrupts or waveforms using a specific time base or could be used to count external events occurring in your system. A side note about MSP430 timers. They don't generate interrupts or any other actions 
when you write to the control register. For example, writing 0 to the counter won't generate a timer A interrupt. Now on to Capture Basics. The Capture feature does just that. When a capture input signal occurs, a snapshot of the counter register is captured. That is, it's copied into the capture register. This is ideal because we can get the timer counter's value captured with no latency and very, very little power used. In fact, the CPU isn't even needed, so it can remain in low power as this capture is done. To summarize, we can see that the top part of the diagram hasn't changed. The timer counter features are just the same as we talked about before. But when a capture is triggered, it's just going to copy the value out of the counter register into the CCR register, also known as the Capture and Compare register. Let's look at some details of the capture capability. The capture input can be connected to a couple of different signals, CCNA or CCNB, or triggered via software. The capture input hardware signals, CCNA and B, are connected differently for each CCR register and device, so you'll need to refer to the data sheet to see what options you have available. When a capture occurs, Besides capturing the counter value, the capture mode can also trigger further actions. One, a CPU interrupt can be generated. Two, we can trigger another peripheral. And three, we can set or reset a pin. As we've seen, timer A and B have multiple CCR registers. Each CCR, though, has its own capture input signal. So, as we've discussed, the capture feature provides a deterministic method of capturing the count value when triggered. While a capture is quite handy, there's another really useful feature of the timers that we'll look at next. A key feature for timers is the ability to create a consistent periodic interrupt. We know that timer A can do this, but its frequency thus far has been limited to counting up to 64K. So while the timer may be consistent, it's not very flexible. Thankfully though, the compare feature of these timers helps to solve this problem. Once again, the top portion of this diagram remains the same, our clock input, the counter, and the action, in this case the interrupt. As you can see, we're going to use the CCR register again, but this time we're going to use it in compare mode. In this mode, whenever a match between the counter and the compare occurs, a compare action is triggered. Compare actions can include, one, generating an interrupt to the CPU, two, signaling another peripheral, you know, such as an A to D conversion, or three, changing the state of an external pin. In fact, the modify pin action is actually quite powerful. Using the timer's compare feature, we can create sophisticated PWM waveforms. We look at generating a simple PWM in the optional lab exercise of this chapter. This example of a Timer Zero A7 gives us a way to summarize the timer's hardware. Remember, timer 0 in this case means the first instance of timer A on the device. Underscore A7 means that it's a timer A device that has seven capture and compare registers, you know, CCRs. The clock input in this example can be driven by TA clock from a pin, A clock, SM clock, or another internal clock called in clock. The clock input can be further scaled down by a 5-bit scalar value. Finally, the TA0IE that is the timer A0 interrupt enable, can be used to allow or prevent an interrupt, you know, the TA0IFG, from reaching the CPU whenever the counter, TA0R, rolls over. Now that we've reviewed the timer counter basics, let's dig into the four steps needed to actually make them go. The first step is configuring timer A's control register, TACTL. What clock do you want to use? Which count mode, which we'll discuss in a minute, do you want to use? And finally, should we generate an interrupt to the CPU when TAR, you know, the counter, rolls back to zero? Step two, set up each CCR that you'll need for your application. In some cases, you'll use the CCR register for capture, while in other cases, you might utilize it for the compare feature. Three, we'll need to start the timer. We also listed clearing timer interrupt flag bits, which is normally done right before starting the timer. Finally, step four. If you're generating interrupts with the timer, you'll need to have one or two interrupt service routines. While interrupts are covered in the last chapter, we'll briefly summarize them again in the context of timer A. By the way, we'll examine more of the timer's features as we look at the timer setup code. Beginning with step one, there are four different hardware choices we need to make in order to configure the timer's counter. 
each of these maps to a driver lib function parameter. The first one selects which instance of timer A you want to program. We have chosen to program TA0, that is, the first instance of timer A. Remember, tar is the timer A's counter register. When we talk about timer A counter register for the first instance, then you might see that abbreviated TA0R instead of just TAR. Conveniently, the driver lib documentation provides enumerations for all the supported choices. For example, timer underscore A0 base, or timer underscore A1 base, or timer underscore B0 base. Since this is the same for all of the driver lib parameters, we won't keep repeating this over and over again, but it's really handy that driver lib includes easy to read enumerations. The second parameter lets you choose which clock source you want to use. We chose SM clock. The next parameter picks one of the clock prescale values. The hardware lets you choose from one of 20 different values. We pick divide by 64. This makes it easier for you to adjust the clock rate closer to the timing that you need for your system. Parameter 4 lets you decide whether to interrupt the CPU when the counter rolls over to zero or not. This parameter ends up setting the TA0 interrupt enable bit. Finally, do you want to have the timer counter register, TAR, reset when the other parameters are configured, or should it be left alone with whatever count value it already contains? We've been programming the timer A configure continuous mode function. What does continuous mode mean? Continuous is just one of four modes that timer can be placed into. Oddly enough, one of the modes is that the timer can be stopped. Of course, one advantage is that it's not consuming any power in this mode. Well, just a minute ago, we looked at the continuous mode. As you can see, the counter counts up to FFFF and then rolls back over to zero. When it rolls over, the timer can generate a CPU interrupt if you enable it to do so. In fact, we can see in this diagram, it had two opportunities to do so, and we've highlighted those with the red arrows. The up mode is similar to continuous, except that instead of counting up to FFFF, it counts up until it reaches the value in the CCR0 register. You may notice in the up case that each timer period can generate two interrupts rather than just one. Also, notice that the driver lib function is now named timer A underscore configure up mode. We'll look more closely at both of these details in a minute. As a quick aside, for each timer, CCR0 is special when compared to the other CCR registers. Besides having interrupt dedicated to it, it's the only one that can act as the count up to value. Finally, the fourth mode is called up down. It's similar to the up mode, except rather than resetting back to zero, it just changes direction and counts back down. This effectively doubles the timer's period. In other words, it halves the frequency. This could be useful, for example, if you're trying to get the timer to go very slowly. Also notice how the timer can generate interrupts every time the counter hits a rail. That is, each time it changes direction. We've already looked at coding up the continuous mode. Let's take a closer look at one of the other configurations, up. As we said, the up mode differs from the continuous mode by resetting back to zero whenever the counter matches CCR0. The, the capture and compare register zero. You can see this with the green line shown here. It counts up to the value found in CCR zero and then resets back to zero. On the other hand, the gray dotted waveform shows us how, in continuous mode, the counter goes past CCR zero and all the way up to zero X FFFF. In the up mode, since we're using the CCR zero register, the timer can generate two interrupts. First, the timer A IFG, which we can see in the upper right-hand corner of this diagram, is TA0 IFG. Also, because of the CCR0 register, we have CC0 IFG. The bit for this is actually called TA0 CC0 IFG. If you compare these two interrupts to the one found in continuous mode, you'll see that they occur more frequently. This is a big advantage of the up mode. Your frequency is not limited to 2 to the 16 counts but rather can be anywhere within the 16-bit counters range. The downside is that you also have to configure the CCR0 register. By the way, you're not seeing a color misprint. The two interrupts do not happen at the exact same time. 
but rather one cycle apart. The CC0 IFG occurs when there is a compare match, while the TA0 IFG interrupt occurs once the counter goes back to zero. Once again, we see that the CCR0 register is special. That is, it's special in comparison to the other CCR registers. It's only the CCR0 that can be used to define the upper limit of the counter in the up or up down mode. The other special feature of CCR0 is that it provides a dedicated interrupt, CC0 IFG. In other words, there is an interrupt vector location dedicated to CC0 IFG. All the other timer A interrupts share a common grouped interrupt vector location. As we just saw, the function timer A configure up mode is used to set up the timer for the up mode. Let's take a look at this function. Like the continuous mode function, timer A configure up mode lets us 1. Choose which timer instance we want, select an input clock, divide down that clock, clear the tar counter, and enable the interrupt that can occur when the counter rolls back to zero. What's new is that this function lets you set the value in the CCR0 compare register. This effectively creates the count up to value. Also, you can determine whether a CPU interrupt is generated when the counter's value matches that in CCR0. If the comparison match is true, and if the CC0 IE bit has been set, then the hardware will set timer A0's CC0 IFG bit and generate an interrupt to the CPU. Okay, stepping back, somewhere in your program, maybe at the beginning of main, you'll want to configure your timers. In this example, it looks like we're doing that in a function called init timer A0. As you might imagine, part one of our timer setup code is the timer A configuration function we just talked about. The next part of our timer configuration code is setting up any additional capture or compare registers that you may want to use. Remember, timer A can have up to seven CCR0 registers. When using the up or up down modes, that leaves us with up to six more CCR registers to program. Actually, we can program all seven if we're using the continuous mode. Please double check with your device's data sheet, though, to verify how many CCR registers are available for each timer A, B, or D that you want to program. So, for an example, let's say we want to set up CCR2 for compare mode. That is, we want to compare CCR2 to the timer counter's tar register and affect some action when they match. As we see here, the cap bit, short for capture bit, needs to be set to zero for the CCR to be in compare mode. In other words, we want to turn capture mode off. Next, you need to write the compare to value into the CCR2 register. Then, when tar equals CCR2, this condition is called EQU2, or equate to. By the way, if we were using CCR6, the match condition would be called equate6. If enabled, equate2 drives the interrupt flag high, that would be CC2 IFG. Also, the timer's output signal, in this case TA0.2, is modified by equate2. This signal is available to other peripherals. For example, the signal could be used by many MSP430s to initiate an analog to digital conversion or, or a DMA transfer. Another option would be to route the signal to a pin. How the signal appears on the pin is very flexible. In just a minute, we'll examine the various pin output modes you can select from. Looking at the appropriate driver lib function, we can see just how easy it is to set up the CCR for compare. The timer A init compare function will, among other things, turn off the capture mode. In other words, it'll put the CCR into compare mode. One of the first choices you need to make is which CCR do you want to use? For our example, we chose CCR2. Next, do you want to interrupt the CPU whenever a match occurs or not? Then, how do you want the timer to treat the output signal? There are eight options for how the signal can be manipulated. For this example, we chose the output mode called set reset. Once again, with so many different output mode choices, we'll come back and speak more about this in just a minute or two. Finally, what compare to value do you want to set into register CR2? We chose a funny looking number. Well, <laughs> that is if you're a vegetarian. 
In a real application, though, you would actually pick this number based upon whatever timing was needed for your system. Adding this to our previous timer code, here's a summary of what we have thus far. Part 1 of our code configures the timer counter, uh, that is, the main counter control register of timer A. Part 2 configures the various capture and compare registers. Due to limited space on this slide, we only set up CCR2. In a real application, you might use all the CCR registers, in which case you'd need to call the timer A init compare function or init capture function multiple times. Before we move on to part three of our timer configuration code, let's take a quick look at those different output mode options. On a previous slide, we saw that the timer has an output signal out, which can be used to drive an internal peripheral or a pin. For example, on the F5529, CCR2 from timer zero can drive pin 24. As we've tried to show here, setting the output mode actually sets the out mod field in timer A0's CCR2 control register. The output mode settings determine how the out signal changes whenever a compare match occurs. It can be handy, if needed, to be able to read the out signal by just looking at bit 2 in the CCR2 control register. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first output mode. As we just saw, each CCR register has its own associated pin. For example, with CCR1 on timer 0, this pin would be named TA0.1. CCR2 would have TA0.2. If the CCR is in compare mode, the pin is an output. For capture mode, it can either be an input or an output. When the pin is used as an output, its value is determined by the out bit field in its control register. Besides routing the CCR out signal to a pin, it can also be used by other MSP430 peripherals. For example, the A to D converter could be triggered by it. So, what is the value of out for any given CCR register? As we said, the value of out is determined by the out mode selection we made. If out mode is equal to zero, then out is not changed by the timer's hardware. That is, it's under software control. You can set out to whatever value you want by just writing to the register. Okay, so then what happens to out when out mode equals one? Well, first, let's look at what happens when tar equals CCR1. Notice when the timer counter tar counts up to the value in CCR1, that is, when they're a match, then a valid comparison is true. The user guide calls this equate one, where CCR1 is equal to the counter. Similarly, we can see that when the counter reaches the value in CCR0, well, they call that equate zero. In fact, you might remember this equate syntax from a little earlier in our discussion. When the output mode is equal to one, we call this the set mode. This means that whenever tar equals CCR1, out will be set and will remain that way until the CCR is reconfigured. Why use set mode? Well, you might find it convenient when trying to create a one-shot type of signal. As we note here, out mod doesn't affect how interrupts work. It only affects how out itself changes. Okay, let's look at output mode two. This one is called toggle reset mode, and it's a bit more interesting than the previous output modes. For each of the names, toggle and reset correspond to a different event. As you can see here, we show the first event. When the counter equals CCR1, that is at, at equate one, then the output is toggled. The second event is when the counter reaches CCR0. When this happens, the second action occurs, in this case, reset. In other words, when the output modes are defined by two names, the first one dictates the value of out whenever CCR equals tar. On the other hand, the second name describes what happens to out whenever CCR0 equals tar. Remember what we stated earlier? CCR0 is often used in a special way. This is another example of how CCR behaves differently from the rest of the CCRs. By the way, notice how with output mode equal to two, the out signal appears to be a pulse whose duty cycle, that is its width, is proportional to the difference between CCR0 and CCR1. In fact, this feature can be used to create PWM waveforms, that is pulse width modulation waveforms. In summary, by showing both out mode equals to one and out mode equals to two on the same diagram, 
we can see how the value of out can be very different depending on which output mode is selected. While we have only studied a couple of the output modes, we hope you'll now be able to decipher the remaining modes based upon their names. Here's a graphical comparison of all the different output waveforms based on the value of out mod. Don't worry, we're almost done with the chapter. Part three of our code only takes one slide to demonstrate. Part three, clear the interrupt flags and start the timer. As described during the interrupts chapter, you weren't required to clear the interrupt flags before enabling an interrupt, but once again, this is common practice. So, in our example here, we clear all three of the interrupts that we configured using the driver library functions. First, we clear the interrupt generated when the counter register overflows back to zero. For timer zero, that means we're clearing TA0 IFG. Then, we clear all of the CCR interrupts. We can do this in a single function by ORing together all of the CCR interrupt flags that we want to clear. We conclude part three by starting the timer. This function only has two parameters. Its first one is to specify which timer we want to start, and the other specifies, once again, the count mode for the timer. In our example, we're using the up mode. Oops, we're warning you about this because this is the mistake we made while developing the workshop. As dumb as it sounds, we miss the fact that you need to set the counter mode, that is up, in the start function. When we cut and pasted this function from another example, we never thought to change this parameter and found out the hard way that you need to specify the count mode in both places, in the configure up mode function and in the start counter function. And finally, we're to part four. Here, we need to manage the code for our interrupts. The last part of our timer code is actually a review since we've already covered interrupts in detail in a previous workshop chapter. The code example, which we'll show on the next slide, handles both timer interrupts. Hopefully, you remember that timer A has one interrupt dedicated to CCR0, as well as a group interrupt for all the other timer A events. In trying to keep our discussion as short as possible, we're not going to go through this code line by line. If you don't remember how to write ISRs and set up interrupt vectors, please refer to the interrupts chapter of this workshop. Our last topic highlights some of the differences between the timer A and timer B peripherals. For the most part, the timer A and timer B peripherals are the same. If you were to port the code from timer A to timer B, as we do in one of the optional lab examples, the biggest thing you'd have to do is replace all the references to A with B. Bottom line though, each timer has its own small advantage. Timer A can latch the capture and compare input bit. This gives timer A a sample and hold feature, which is a slight advantage when using the timer for communications, like for example, when bit banging a UART in software. Then again, most MSP430 devices now have dedicated UART peripherals. On the other hand, timer B has a couple of features that give it a slight edge when creating PWM waveforms. For example, by double buffering the CCR registers, they can be updated without altering the current values, which is handy when driving H-bridges. Once again, we finally reach the lab exercise portion of the chapter. Similar to the interrupt lab, we want to toggle an LED based upon an interrupt. In this case though, we'll use timer A to generate the interrupt as opposed to a push button. In part A of the lab, we'll put timer A into continuous mode and use the main timer counters rollover interrupt, TA0 IFG. In part B, we do the same thing as in part A, but this time we use the up mode. Oh, and we also provide a solution for part B where we use timer B. Comparing these two solutions will show you just how similar these two peripherals are. In part C, we actually dispose of interrupts. Rather than toggling the LED in an ISR, if we can, it's much better to drive it directly from the timer's output. In order to make this happen, we'll need to use a wired jumper to connect the output of the timer to one of the Launchpad's LEDs. Here's a picture of the jumper connection you'll need to make for the F5529 USB Launchpad. This connects the output of timer A0 to an LED. And here's the jumper connection you'll need to make for the FR5969 FRAM Launchpad. Finally, the optional Part D of this lab uses a driver library function to create a simple PWM waveform. 
You can change the blink rate of the LED by changing the PWM's parameters. We have you set up the PWM to blink the LED, but if you make the rate fast enough so that the eye can't see the blinking, you can use this function to make the LED appear bright or dim. While this isn't as fancy as we can get with PWM waveforms on timer A or on timer B, it's a great way to get started with PWM.